wins aren't there, you still buy in 100%, then things don't fall apart. And, and that's exactly what I think you need in order to fill in the void that was left behind by Mike Vrabel. Just realized the entire beginning of the show we were muted how about wow. that hey welcome into the hot that's read not, podcast that's not my that's it's, not my that problem. is it's my fault the hand up on that one hey welcome into the hot read podcast for friday january 26th i'm your host houston freeze director our published content here at broadwaysportsmedia.com we're also brought to you by the 440 podcast network and once again i am joined here live at boom Boss craft pizza and tap house in spring hill by producer jt like i was saying to you when i was muted and you could just see my lips flapping we were talking this morning about how we were going to starve ourselves today so that we could eat as much food as possible when we got here. And now we're about an hour away and I can't wait. Yes, I've had two and a half iced coffees today, you know, as a little bit of an appetite suppressant sure. so that I could right, right. bide my time. But now we are here <laughs> once again um, because of the weather last week. We were not here at Boom Buzz, but now we are back better than ever. Uh, with so much to talk about, unlike what we would have had last week. So Anything happened today? No. I don't. I don't know if a lot of things happened today, but uh, we are here once again. Super excited to be back. Yeah, we're stoked. Talking, of course, about the Titans' introduction of their new head coach, Brian Callahan, was at that press conference today. Heard a lot of things, saw a lot of things. We're going to go through all of the highlights from what was a pretty long uh, live stream. If you didn't get to catch the whole thing on YouTube or, or wherever you watch your live streams, we've got eight clips that are really. The, the most important bits from that press conference that we're going to dive into, we're going to play them here on the show for you, and then react to some of the things that Brian Callahan had to say, give you uh, an idea as to what the vibe was. A very different situation at St. Thomas Sports Park today than any situation I was in during the Vrabel era. So we're going to talk about that, and then we'll dive into the best bet gauntlet, of course, today. We've got, our, uh, we've got some redeeming of ourselves to do in the conference championship round, but we've got some picks that we are awfully fond of. So looking forward to diving into all of that, as well as your comments and questions, anything you have to say regarding today's press conference, the Titans introducing their head, new head coach. We'd love to hear from you. The way you can do that is joining us over on Broadway sports media's YouTube page. It's Broadway sports media on YouTube. Find this live stream. And in the comment section of that live stream, you can be a part of the conversation like Shrike and Derek and Kyle uh, are already a, a part of uh, today's proceedings. We appreciate you guys being here with us. Hey, one more thing. If you're with us live, we appreciate you being here. Do us one last favor. If you're watching on YouTube, hit subscribe. We want to get as many subscribers on the Broadway Sports Media YouTube channel as we possibly can. And we see how many of you watch but aren't subscribed. It's free to you. It costs you nothing but a click of your finger. And it's very helpful to us. So we really appreciate it if you could do that. Also hit like, hit retweet, Hit uh, share if you want to send it to a buddy. Anything you can do to help us get as many eyeballs on this product live as possible. That would be much appreciated. Okay. Um, and we appreciate those of you, Derek and Kyle and Shrike, all saying that uh, we could. The, the, the beginning was a silent reaction. It was just, it was an old style picture where you just had to kind of guess based on our facial expressions and movement what we were thinking and saying. That didn't go over very well. So we're going to actually talk to you today. Um, at the Callahan press conference, I show up. I don't know if, if you noticed, it's a little rainy today, a little, yes. little wet outside. Oh, incredibly. Um, and so we get there, the hallways are squeaky and wet. And then I get into the elevator with our buddy here at 440 Podcast Network, Braden Gall. We get in the elevator to head up to the top floor. Different situation in terms of where the press conference is held because they need a bigger room because it's a big event. And so we head up to the very top level of St. Thomas Sports Park. Uh, and this was the, it all, it all got, went uphill from the beginning of my day there uh, at the facility because it was so wet. I get in the elevator with Braden. We're t carrying on casual conversation. I lean up against the wall uh, and then my feet swiftly fly out from under me and I bust my butt about as dramatically as you possibly can. Not like sat down, like laying on my back, sprawled out across the entire floor of the elevator. Braden, of course, can't help himself but laugh. I'm laughing. It, he, he was very concerned. I appreciate him being concerned for my well-being. I'm just glad it was just him and I in there and not some strangers or God forbid somebody that I was trying to impress. So it that was the worst part, uh, me completely busting my ass in the elevator early on. But then we got to the actual press conference and there immediately was a, a lighter feeling in the air. That was kind of the general, the vibes were high, um, which it's not to say that they never were during the Mike Verbal era, but um, and this, I, I don't know the best way to, to articulate this. Things were just more relaxed 
there wasn't a massive personality in the room that was kind of sucking up a lot of the oxygen, which is again, not inherently a bad thing, but it just was really different. And, um, I, you know, one of the things that we're not going to spend a lot of time on today, but a lot of people on Twitter went crazy about was one of the things that Brian Callahan said in his uh, first statement was he quoted a very, apparently a very famous soccer coach in uh, somewhere in Europe, European well, sports. Yeah. yeah. I don't if know. you're, if you're a do anti, you, did you know this? Okay. Yes. If you're, it, it is the, I believe either the current or past uh, manager of, I believe it was Liverpool. Liverpool. Yeah. Um, and so if you are, if you are a staunch Liverpool supporter, you really liked what he had to say. And then if you were like most other people on, on a, on Twitter today that do not like Liverpool, you did not like what he said. So I, I had like three or four soccer friends who are just soccer folks text me in the middle of me being there trying to do my thing, being like, oh, I like this guy. I'm like, <laughs> okay, all right, let's yeah. let's pump the brakes. I think obviously with uh, Liverpool, there's a lot of different opinions I over suppose. there. I have no idea. Um, and so that got that the reaction like that but, today. But the reason I bring that up is because it, apparently, I guess he's a, European soccer fan. I know that he's a, an F1 fan. Um, so he must be a big European guy. And um, to, to kind of tie this, this in to land this plane on the whole lighter feeling in the air topic, we were in the press room afterwards and I was talking to John Glennon and um, he was saying, this guy's more F1. Vrabel was more F you was <laughs> kind of the, that was kind of the difference in, in the, uh, the vibes department there. But it was very clear early on that, and this is something that we kind of could already have told you, but this was just confirmation. The Titans pulled a classic pendulum swing rebound tire with replacing Ryan Callahan uh, in place of Mike Vrabel's empty head coaching office. It, it It's one of those things where you go from a guy with a big, debilitating is the wrong word, just like overwhelming personality suppressing suppressing people folks are maybe a little bit scared of him a little bit or you're intimidating. on intimidating sure those are great words for it you go from that to a guy who's pretty laid back not not like a beta by any means um but but somebody who's just like got a chill bone in their body a little bit um and and you also go from a guy that you know is more defensive and ceo type to to offensive scheme x's and o's football nerd analytics um modern nfl like those are the things that were immediately evident. Wow, these these two folks, Vrabel and Callahan, kind of couldn't be any different in that regard. And you see that a ton. I mean, NFL, we talk about this a lot on the show. NFL teams with GMs, with head coaches, they make these people in relationships. They make violent swings of the pendulum back and forth because you you, as is true with anything in life, you want what you can't have. And so the Titans chose what for the past six years they they felt they couldn't have. Yeah, I exa that's exactly how I would put it as well. And as Kenneth says in the comments here, no longer walking on eggshells in the building. That's kind of how it felt a little bit. Is a, is a good way to put it. Uh, Roshan also saying, uh, one day in and Callahan is the most personable Titans coach in at least a decade and maybe uh, ever. Sure hope he's <laughs> actually good. Yeah, well, he's a, he's a charmer for sure, but let's see if he can charm fans I, on I the was field. I was about to say, being a charmer the decisions he counts makes for as well. nothing in terms of actually remaining employed as yes. an NFL ball and coach. Then, uh, there's a lot of... There's a lot of you know, certified jerks that have won a lot of football games. Yes. Uh, the greatest coaches of all time come to mind as guys that maybe you wouldn't want to grab a beer with, but they sure know what they're doing out there. Yes. And then Shrike, just uh, to your point here, says Liverpool can go to hell, but Klopp is fantastic. So oh, that, I don't, I, all of this is right over my head. Me neither. Okay. But like you can see the the reaction that it elicited. People are passionate. Today. Yes. Is what I can tell you. Um, But yeah, so my, my general, and before we dive into some of the clips, just my overarching, impression of Brian Callahan from this press conference. And again, it's day one. It's the spring stakes. Couldn't be any lower at the moment. Like it's all uphill from here in terms. I had somebody, somebody like giving the media a hard time for asking softball questions. It's, it's January. It's an introductory press conference. One, why would we want to get off on the worst possible foot with a guy? Uh, and two, it's not like we're going to have, countless opportunities that aren't like a more corporate big event with a bunch of people that aren't just media there to ask him these I mean, like we're gonna have a chance to ask these questions this is not Rand carthon this is not one of two press conferences yes. he's doing this year he's gonna be doing one every day all year long 
and when I mean, we get into the football season. It, so, and there might not be a better example because I'm assuming he'll be there next week when we maybe get to talk to him at the Senior Bowl next week, or at, at least some of their brass. At, at the very least, we'll hear from him again when they're making draft picks, and, exactly. and him and Rand Carthon come sauntering into the room at St. Thomas Sports Park, and they explain why they got the like. We're gonna we're gonna have a chance to ask tough questions. I yes. promise. Today was not for that. Today was. His day, right, is celebrating a guy who got a head coaching job, and that's a big accomplishment, and getting just an introduction to the guy. So I think important questions were asked. There were some dumb ones. There always are. Uh, but there were some important ones, and so we're going to dive into that. The general takeaway for me is this. He, first off, is immediately, it, it's immediately evident that Brian Callahan is an A-plus human being. Does that make sense? He, he's somebody that you can tell out of the gate is a guy that you would enjoy being family friends with, that you would enjoy getting a beer with, that you would enjoy working for or with. Somebody that deeply cares about his profession, deeply cares about his people. And you saw that was really evident when he was listing off the laundry list of folks that helped him get to this point. And he got choked up about it. And he summed it up the best in that moment, I think, saying, you can tell just how much I care about these people. It's it's a guy that actually to to the point of being different from Rabel has has that yeah, soft is the wrong word but like well, has an emotional bone in his so, body. So a the bit. word that I was going to use is that vulnerability that you would never yes. get from a Mike Vrabel type. He in was a realness, to, yeah, a realness, realness a and, and with that vulnerability c comes realness as well. And I think uh, what struck me the most at that point, right there, as you said, he was a very he seems like a very caring guy about what he does. And um, the people that are around him, and I think, as the 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 first impression that I I tweeted you during the or texted you during the press conference uh, was that he has that same vulnerability and emotional and caring aspect that um, like Dan Campbell has, yes. except maybe yeah. like not with like a bump of cocaine as well, and just like on the, the thousand levels. <laughs> He's not on his seventeenth coffee of the yes. day. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. He, I, I think. As far as I'm aware, and may, this is me thinking for two seconds, maybe I'm totally missing. I, I can't remember any other introductory press conferences for GMs or head coaches in which guys started to choke up a little bit besides Dan Campbell and now Brian Callahan. And so that, I, that tracks. It might also just be a very surreal moment for someone who, like we've I'm said, sure it is. who has been in, in rooms and in, in, in and around football with his dad since he's been a teenager. Like to have finally become a head coach it is probably just a surreal moment for him as well in his life. And so I think that is a totally fair reaction for him to have today. Well, and the way that he spent so long listing off the people that he wanted to thank and talking about the process of getting to where he is now, it read to me like a guy who his entire life wanted to do this, felt he was good enough to do this, but dealt with. You know, folks like to make fun of nepo babies getting jobs and like you know nepotism in in the workplace, and that 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 is totally fair. There are instances where that is inappropriate or or just unfair. Um, but the other side of the coin is when you're somebody in a position like him, who I, I believe is truly very talented at this, it, it does know what he's doing, is qualified. You you live behind the shadow of your your father or whoever in your family is the reason why you were in it in the first place, and you can get caught up in spending your entire career focusing on trying to make your own way or get somewhere and prove to people somehow that you are where you are because of who you are and not who you're related to. And so that kind of felt like a moment for me where he's like, I did this without ever taking a job from my dad, without ever working with or for my dad. I did it aside from the fact that my dad was a head coach in this league. I did it my own. And now screw you guys. I'm going to sit and talk about it how happy I am about it for as long as I like at this press conference. This is my day. And frankly, more power to you. I mean, what a stand up guy not to thank most of his family, but even go and thank the in-laws as well. I don't know how cousins, many a lot of Jackson. Would, would, there. Uh, Apparently got a lot of relatives. Names. Given yeah. That is names, yeah. a contentious topic. It's a pro move. I, will, I mean, it, it is, is a pro it move. It is very much. Um, that's um, some brownie points for so sure. So he just showed how much of a stand up guy it was. And I think he absolutely deserves the moment today. Okay. Moving on from the actual, like gushing about the person. Let's talk about the football side of things. The, the, the general reaction for me about him as a football guy and the kind of coach that he's going to be is he seems to me like a natural football nerd. I say that in a, in a uh, complimentary way, like the, the, you know, the football brainiac type who has spent his entire life in and around football, around football guys, the other end of that spectrum, you know, the Dan Campbell types, not to say Dan Campbell's a, a meathead, like people make him out to be, but that more Mike Vrabel, Dan Campbell esque guy, football guys, he's been around those guys for so long that he 
does a, a, a great job of having a balance of those two things, being the football guy when he needs to be the football guy and being the football brainiac nerd when he needs to be the football brainiac nerd to, to power the engine of his team. And so I think he's somebody that has a really great balance in that regard, and that came off pretty strongly to me in the press conference as well. Yeah, I, I think that you could tell that this is a guy – Unlike some other press conferences, aka Mike McCarthy's, where he just like went up there and said like flat out like, "Oh yeah, I basically lied in my interview to get this job" or something like that. No, this guy knows what he's talking about. He cares about his work, and I think that really showed. Uh, Michael asked a, a good question here. He says, "Curious what y'all's thoughts are on how the locker room will adjust from being coached by Vrabel to being coached by Cali, who, which is what he uh, asked us to. He he alluded to the fact that that's what he wants to go by." Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing like Vrabes, he's going to be Cali now. That's a great question, uh, Michael. We're, I, I want to shelf that for just a moment because I think there's a clip that we have coming up here in just a second that really speaks to that. So let's hold on to that comment and let's go ahead and dive into these eight clips that I think are really the highlights that best encapsulate what we heard from him today. This first one, he was asked about his general coaching style. What kind of coach are you going to be? What is your approach? And here's what he had to say. My coaching style is is consistent. Uh, my demeanor is pretty consistent. Um, I pride myself on being a great teacher. Uh, that's first and foremost. As a coach, that's all you really care about is, is how well can you teach and articulate to the players what they need to do. Um, I, have the, I have plenty of intensity. Um, I'm a pretty laid back demeanor most of the time, as you guys will see. But um, when it's time to make, make corrections and, and bring the energy that's necessary, I can do that. Um, but my coaching style is, is a teaching coaching style. Uh, we're trying to make sure that our guys know exactly what to do, how to do it, um, and can go execute at, at, a, at a really high level and as fast as humanly possible. Now, in that regard, I don't think he's going to be all that different from Rabel because one of the calling cards of the Rabel tenure was he's a not just a teacher, but he's a hands-on teacher. He's the one putting on the blocking pad. He's the one wanting to get in there during the draft season and get his hands on a guy to feel the power, to feel the technique. Um, and then at practice, it was a lot of the same. It was putting on that blocking pad, holding, holding out a, a, a blocking dummy, whatever it may be, constantly going to the different position groups and telling them what they need to be doing different, what they need to be doing differently, um, or, or what they're doing well and trying to emphasize certain things, but it was all very technique based. It was all very, um, I just, I, I think Vrabel was as much a teacher as I've ever seen in a head football coach in terms of practical application. And I don't doubt that Callahan is the same way. I do wonder, however, whether he's going to be a teacher in that same way that Vrabel was, that hands-on. I mean, he's you know he's not the former player type that he did play in college, I believe, but he, he's he's not a you know a multi-time NFL championship winner. Um, he, he's he's not somebody that has a, a big long resume at the highest level, and somebody who uh, somehow freakishly at fifty years old is still like as big. And strong as a lot of these NFL players. Um, so he, I, I don't know. I, he strikes me, JT, and you can tell me if you disagree as somebody that's more of a teacher in the classroom. X's and O's. Let's watch the tape. Let's let's uh, let's outsmart, out prepare in the meeting room our opponent than necessarily the kind of teacher that is teaching you technique hands on out on the practice field. Yeah, no, I think I think I would also agree with you there. And I think it's the same pendulum effect as bringing in him as a personality, right? This is kind of the vision that Amy Adams Strunk and Rand Carthen want to take here. And, and that just kind of combines with, with everything that they really want to do here. And I think for better or for worse, I mean, you have heard over the past year or so, the maybe not so glaring and remarkable reviews that some players have felt about Mike Vrabel and namely some other guys who were cut earlier in the year and have been very vocal about it on Twitter. Um, so maybe this is a good thing for this locker room who do have some, who do maybe have some guys who would excel with that Vrabel type, but now that they're kind of established more in the league, they're able to continue to do that themselves. And our chat has completely gone off the rails. No, with, with I, I was going to, I was going to let you... Zach thinks that address this thing. I yeah. appreciate it. Zach thinks that I pooped my pants in the elevator. I, I don't know why or where that came from. It sounds like it sounds like Braden on a football show alluded to, uh, me doing something worse than farting in the elevator. I wouldn't say falling is worse. So I don't know. I, that's Braden's opinion. That's not mine. 
Uh, but it was very funny. And I, I'm wearing the same pants that I was wearing. So if I put my pants, then I probably should change them. I don't I don't think that I did. I think that I just fell and busted my ass. Um, so let's we can put that to bed now. Did, did you? Is there something on the bottom of your pants? Come to Boombaz and find out. He'll, he'll put on a show for you after the show. It's only the weirdest way to convince people to come out here and see us. But it is a way. So sure, come and find out. I will let you take a look for yourself if you so desire. Um, but let's get to the next video yes. and, and talk more about what we're actually talking about today. Two videos here back to back, offensive and defensive philosophy. Brian Callahan asked about his general um, approach to his side of the ball on offense, which we're going to listen to first. But then I'm, I think there's something very clever he said um, and, and intriguing in, in the way that he approaches his defensive philosophy as an offensive coordinator. Let's play both of those videos. Put the players we have in great position. Um, let them be able to find their roles, define what those roles are for them, uh, and put them in, in the matchups that, they, that we feel are to our advantage. Um, that's a very broad, general uh, offensive philosophy, but um, that's sort of the starting point. Uh, we want to be great detail in the passing game, uh, route definition, route spacing. Uh, want to be able to complete balls at a high percentage. Uh, that's that's always going to be the goal. Um, the run game, we still want to be physical. Don't don't get that uh, don't get that part twisted. That's been part of the Titans' identity for a long time, and it will continue to be. Uh, we'll be a physical football team, um, and we'll be able to, to to run the ball the way we need to to win football games. Um, okay, I lied. I don't want to play the second one yet because I, I forgot that there were a couple things in there I wanted to address specifically. So obviously, doubling down on on some of the clips that were circulating about him already being a the best teams in the league typically throw the ball the best. He talks about first and former for, first and. For, First and foremost, there we go. Uh, passing the ball, having a passing game that is active. He, I don't know if it was in that clip or, or later on in the um, in in the press conference talking about how he wants to have high completion percentage. He wants to have a a, a spread um, offense where you have good route spacing and distribution uh, downfield. All these things that lend itself to protection lends itself to, like you said, higher completion completion percentage, lends itself to having a more successful passing game, which in his opinion, and I think most of our opinions, is the key to having the best offenses in the NFL right now. That's a good thing. He then does uh, maybe a little fan service here. He uh, he looked at Amy Adams' trunk and ran card, then he said this. running. We're still going to run the ball when we need to, he says, parsing it with when we need to, talking about how uh, you know that's been the identity of the Titans for a long time, but we're, gonna, we're still going to be a tough football team. I believe that you will still be a tough and physical football team. I don't know if it's going to look the same as it has been in the past, but in general, I think his offensive philosophy there, albeit generic, um, is one that is something to be excited about for the Titans because it is different. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. And I think it's different because, and I think we both can agree on this, it's kind of the end of the Derrick Henry era with Vrabel leaving. Um, it's so too do goes Derrick Henry. And so now enter a guy in Ty J Spears who, I've heard this week really bring up an interesting point that, that I didn't really think about as a comp when bringing out, but maybe an even more explosive Joe Mixon and just how maybe Brian Callahan can use him both in the running game and also the passing, passing game. game. We've right. seen Brian Callahan um, especially scheme up some games where it is Joe Mixon heavy and it really works. You can go back to the game last year against the Carolina Panthers where he has five touchdowns and just absolutely explodes. Like their game plan last year for better or for worse was we're going to give the ball to Joe Mixon all day, every day against this Carolina <laughs> Panthers. See what happens. And it worked really <laughs> yeah. well. So I think when, when you think about it that way, I think there is still a lot of opportunities um, to use the run game effectively because that is what this team has been built on. But at the same time, like you said, this team hasn't scored 30 points in a long time. And how do you usually score a lot of points? You pass the you ball pass really the ball, well. Sure. So I think that is, I think that's, and I love, way to that, go. I love that you bring that up because there were mul multiple times this year. I would turn to you in person or text you during a game or watching film being like, it's just a matter of time before we have a Ty J Spears explosion game. Like you can just the way that he plays the juice that he has, the conditioning uh, that, that he, that he has out there on the football field. I, it's going to happen. There are going to be some of those games. I think in the future, if all goes to plan where you've got, Ty J Spears, 200 all-purpose yards, three touchdowns. Um, and it's just the Ty J. Where were you for the Ty J Spears game kind yeah. of thing? Okay, now let's listen to his general defensive philosophy and, and pay attention to the end of this clip where he talks about how he, as an offensive-minded coach, uses his offensive mindset to his advantage when trying to put together his own defense. It looked like for us by 
the types of people we're going to bring in. But at the end of the day, you got to have a very flexible and adaptable defense. You still have to be physical. You still have to run and hit. You have to tackle well. Um, you have to force errors. There's a lot of things you can do that are that in the coverage structure game, in the pressure package game, where it makes it really hard on offense. And so I know it gives me problems. I know the hard defenses to game plan against. Um, and those are the things that I'm looking for in, in the style of defense we're going to play. Um, without getting too far down, a bunch of characteristics don't mean much until we put the pads on. But um, that's what I, that's what I look for. Is what makes it hard for me as an offensive coach. That's the style of defense that I'm looking for. Bingo. That's exactly what you need your offensive head coach to say. I love that he said it that way. And it's not, he's not the first to have this idea, but I'm glad that that's his general approach to it. As an offensive schemer, as an offensive play caller, let me identify the things that I can't stay. Like when you're sitting there just mumbling to yourself on the sideline on, on, on a, a Sunday in a third quarter when you're behind and nothing seems to be working and you know why and you can't quite figure out how to counter what the defense is doing to you, jot that down. Do that yourself. Like that's the kind of thing you need to be doing. And obviously that's his his approach. What is difficult for me as an offensive guy? Let's make our defense be that. Yeah, I really love that. And the ability to learn from your mistakes, I think is something that this Titans team has lacked for a little bit now. And I just think- banging your head Just banging wall. against yeah. it, it, Like we said this year, the one word that I would- describe this past 2023 Titans team was insanity yeah. because they would never change up what they were doing. But Brian Callahan's ability uh, to change up and, and change and do things differently and learn from your mistakes, I think is a big attribute and something that Amy Adams drunk and Ren Carthen really liked from him. We asked him, um, I forget who I think Paul asked him. I think this was the first question actually, or no, I might be getting it twisted. Paul at some point, Paul Karski asked him if he had been in contact with Will Levis yet, and he said yes, and had some thoughts on what Will Levis under his tutelage could be. Let's listen to what he had to say. I have. I called Will uh, last, or I don't even know what day it is anymore, but uh, I called Will a few days ago um, after I got the job, and then I saw him here today. He, he was working out, so I got a chance to, to catch up with him. Um, I told him he's leaving town, I think, tomorrow morning, but he'll be back. But I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know him. Uh, I can't wait to get to work with him. Um, he's got a lot of really special physical talents um, that I'm that I'm excited to go to go see if we can make better and um, everything about him so far has been fantastic and I'm excited to get to go further down into it everything about him so far has been fantastic is a pretty glowing review I would say um, Zach brings up an interesting point in the comments I think this is the most important thing here will Levis tweeted out an ad for DraftKings. apparently I've not seen this not one mention of Brian Callahan although Brian Callahan today went out of his way to mention that he'd talked to Will Levis uh, does Levis hate him already I think the answer obviously is yes and so Zach I appreciate you bringing that up that's very important um, that's big J journalism work right there uh, but no I I think that's the most exciting element to this this new coaching regime We've seen Brian Callahan with a number of different coach or number of different quarterbacks in the past, many with a lot of success. And the thing that keeps coming back to mind for me, and once we get an opportunity to talk to him more, I'm guessing in training camp, I'll have to ask him this question. Um, but what we talked about when he was hired, the last quarterback he coached is a guy that needs to be schemed up and taught differently than the way Will Levis needs to, just the way that they're built, right? Like we talked, Joe Burrow, he is at his best when you are throwing 30, 35, 40 times a game, a lot of short and intermediate stuff, throwing outside the numbers, taking shots downfield at times outside the hashes. Will Levis, kind of the opposite in the sense that his prototypical quarterback mold is, hey, let's throw 15, 20, 25 times, maybe 30 if you're trailing. Uh, let's throw to the middle of the field. Let's average like eight, nine, 10 yards depth of target. Let's take 15 yard shots down the middle. Um, let's, let's hit in breakers. Let's stand in the pocket, step up and make the throw like they're very different guys. And so like we talked about on whatever the last episode, I forget the episode where we had this conversation. Um, the Titans better have hired the guy in Brian Callahan and not the scheme that Brian Callahan's name is attached to. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. And um, I remember also when we were talking about that episode where that who brought that point up, it was Ben Solak. So that was, uh, yes, it was I forgot. I forgot to give credit. Yeah. Ben Solak, who I'm a big and, fan and of. And I he totally agree first. with that. He's and I think that's I something that, that uh, Brian Callahan can really play towards. And that is um, just playing to the strengths of the quarterback. And he's been around so many different diverse quarterbacks who have for better or for worse, have been these gunslinger type of guys. Plus in, Tim in, Tebow. 
and plus Tim Tebow. In, in you got throw him in there. Certain doesn't, situations. Fit, doesn't fit in with the rest, um, but he was there. But I think when you when you take it down to its core, from Derek Carr to Peyton Manning to Matt Stafford to Joe Burrow, these are guys who throw the ball really well. And I think that even though they're throwing bold, they're, bold take. they're throwing the ball in different ways, <laughs> right, right, right. I think that that's something that Brian Callahan can really focus on. I agree. Um, okay, the next clip here, our four, fifth clip. He was asked about the obvious number one glaring hole on this Titans team. The, on the Titans dashboard, uh, there are seven flashing red lights, and they six of them have to do with their protection issues. The offensive line, the in a, uh, talking about a nice passing game. Step one is protect the quarterback, give him time to pass the ball downfield. But Brian Callahan went into some detail about how he views in general protection issues on an offense. Points out how they're a holistic. Um, how it's it's a holistic issue more than it is an offensive line issue many times. Let's hear what he had to say. Um, there's a lot of things that go into protection. Um, some of it starts with as simple as you got to go win. Uh, you got to win versus tight coverage. Um, protection is, a, is an everybody problem. Uh, the quarterback's got to get rid of the ball on time. Uh, they have to work, work through progressions quickly. Um, so to say that it's a it's a specifically the offensive line needs to fix the protection problem, I, I don't agree with that. Um, I think it's a it's a holistic offensive issue uh, if you have protection problems. And there's a lot of ways you can uh, help weaknesses, um, highlight strengths, and everybody's involved in the process. Um, as far as profiles of offensive linemen and players, you know, obviously you're looking for for those the guys that are great at pass pro. Um, you're looking for guys that can anchor, guys that got great length. Um, you know, we'll talk about all the traits at a later date, but um, schematically you can help a ton. You can chip, you can bang edges. Um, backs got to be fantastic in pass protection. They got to know who to block and how to block them. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a holistic offensive issue. And so our job is to find a way to make sure everyone knows all the specifics of what we're trying to get done. And then they can technically go execute it. And as somebody who has been covering this team for a couple of years, watching them for many, many more, that's another thing that he has said that just it, there's a there's a shot of dopamine in my brain because it's it's like finally we have somebody that is one going to it sounds be very intentional about fixing the titans long lasting long standing protection issues that they've had um and a big part of that is personnel we know but two is aware of and happy to talk about the fact that hey this is it's more than just getting the lineman right right you can there are things you can do scheme wise to not fix issues, but work around issues in a pinch. There are things that you can do as a whole team that lend themselves to better protection, which is going to be important because it's going to take more than one offseason to fix what the Titans have going on up front. No, I totally agree with you. And it'll be a very interesting question that I'm sure Brian Callahan will be asked multiple times throughout the offseason here with the Titans having the eighth overall draft pick. And now currently saying my that, brain, when he said this, I wanted to go. So lineman, lineman, <laughs> so lineman. However, <laughs> as we said on to, on a Tuesday show, there is a clip of him saying we've used two top 35 picks on wide receivers. True. And where are the Titans picking right now in a spot where there very much could be a blue chip wide receiver, two top 40 picks and yeah. a blue chip, uh, offensive lineman. So what is he going to do? It'll be very interesting to see which Can't side wait to spend the next which side 14, matters 15 more shows him. discussing yeah. which of those things are going to do. And then in the end, still not really have much. Of um, OK, it's just side note, because the some of the our friends are really trying to get us off track here in the comments. But I, I do want to address it because I'm immature and I think it's funny. Uh, Zach saying, in all seriousness, you cannot convince me that Will Levis has not pooped his pants as an adult. I agree the way that he. The, the veininess, the, 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 the mayo in the coffee, the vascularness. So I was going to talk about, that's fair. That's a good point. Just from a digestive standpoint, yep. I was going to say from a workout standpoint, from a gym, uh weight room standpoint, the way that he's just so jacked, like you don't get that big unless you're really straining. And all it takes is one day with a little bit of the rumblies and tummies. I I'm with you on that, Zach. Uh, I, I would agree also, you know, especially if one day he decided to get a little extra and do the coffee, mayo, and then the creatine also in there, mix mm, it all up. That's mm -hmm, a recipe for disaster mm -hmm, right there. The, the, the highly caffeinated pre-workout. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then Stoney with the Sobros Network saying, did either of you guys catch a glimpse of how cheeked up Brian Callahan is? I know this was something that you were uh, very interested in finding out earlier today, Stoney. I, I, I did generally get a, a view of, of his build. I would say that it's a uh, moderate athletic cheekiness. Uh, it's not 
that that's my that's my professional opinion on that and this is a very serious show so you're welcome um okay next clip here talking about analytics and i really have nothing to say about this besides just i want to talk about a shot of dopamine for titans fan let's hear your head coach talk about analytics for a minute analytics you know i think that it's a term that's a broad a broad stroke term but there's a lot of details that go into it a lot of different ways it fits um at the end of the day you're using you're using uh hard concrete data to help inform decision making uh and there's there's that's great the more smart people um, the more uh information that you're given the better decisions you can make and so that's always going to be a part moving forward um, i believe in that information i believe in that data uh, and again the the game management part, uh, the statistical analysis, all those things uh, play a huge role in how we're going to build our, our, our organization. And they, they're, they're important and it matters. So um, I believe in it. Good. I'm, gl I'm glad that he likes Perfect. analytics. Yep. Uh, can we move on? Yes. Just, okay, cool. <laughs> analytics. That's, that's a positive. That's just a lot of the things we've said already. Okay, two more clips. And uh, this, this first one is just we asked him about Hiring a staff. What's the plan? What's the approach? Um, and here is what he had to say in terms of filling out his uh, coaching staff. We'll be patient. Uh, we have people in mind. There's people we're going to talk to. Um, we're not in a rush. Uh, we can we can take we can talk to as many people as we like. Um, as those things come uh, more into a clearer focus, as I actually get to go sit in my office and work, um, you guys will hear more about it. But um, the process won't be rushed. We're gonna we're gonna get the right people. Um, we're gonna find great teachers. We're gonna find people of high character, find great communicators, um, and guys that coach with great energy and passion. And so that's what we're looking for. And, and we hope to find them. And we're going to, we're going to uh, leave no stone unturned to find those guys. And uh, so obviously not in any hurry. Uh, I would imagine it, it, it may take a while for him to fill out that staff entirely. We have our first day, uh, coordinator candidate request. We're going to talk about it a little bit later in the news, but that's, that's kind of it. And it, it, it wouldn't shock me if it did take a look. The Titans were very quick in finding their head coach. Now they can be more, uh, they, they, they have the luxury of spending a little bit more time being really deliberate and uh, thorough in the way that they go about putting together his coaching staff. The one guy that people will want to hear about is his dad, Bill Callahan. And you texted me this in the middle of it because we both caught it. Um, the, he was asked about this, two different questions. Both questions he, he answered with pretty dismissive answers. Uh, the first question, I believe, was along the lines of, have you ever thought about interviewing your dad for a job? Which is a fair question because that's objectively a strange. Imagine, interviewing your, imagine interviewing your dad to work for you in whatever line of work you're in. That's kind of strange. Um, he said, "He said no, I've not actually thought about that. that uh, nope, I haven't. Uh, and then he was asked by, I believe, Teresa Walker, whether or not he's on the short list of guys to, to consider. And Brian essentially said, oh, you know, he's under contract with the Browns. So, you know, it's not, I can't really do anything. can't say anything about that one way or another. Those are the things that he said, and on paper, in a courtroom transcript being read out by the by the secretary, that's going to sound way worse than it came across in the room. You texted me as soon as he said it, that smirk, and I agree that in general, the, the facial expression on Brian Callahan's uh, face, his expression did not in any way match the words coming out of his mouth in that moment. Indeed. It was the first thing that I saw. And it's a wink, wink, nod, it's nod. It's almost situation. like the same smirks that we've had to endure through this entire episode with this chat. I feel like <laughs> trying to be professional <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. The, the, the audience is relentless, but yes, I agree. It sounds like they don't even listen to what we're saying. No, I think we're just talking to ourselves. Not. I think, point, I think but... it's just the conversation between me and you, but no, I feel like there have been conversations and there are things behind closed doors that whether you can you can say it's tampering or not i find it hard to say that they have not even calling least, your parents is not tampering how dare you i it's how it's, it's how dare it's probably you. happened and i think that it will continue to happen and i i think it's a better sign than the, it's that's the kibosh the, the nfl arraigns him you, you called bill callahan three times he's my dad i was seeing how the how pops is doing come on not not allowed to talk to my parents hello um yeah, well, I, I am still firmly on the I think it's going to happen eventually. It may not be soon, but I think eventually Bill Callahan will be in Tennessee is my just if I had no inside intel, just reading the tea leaves on that. That's how I feel. Are we kind of on the same page there? I think so. And when we get to the news, we'll talk about a team who also had it was in a similar oh, situation. Yes. Yep, and yep, we can yep. discuss that one team did the right thing, I think, and is a good team. Setting and I think they're a good example for the rest of the league. a good example for say. the rest of the league, I would say. Okay, so. last clip here. And this is the best question. It was asked by our buddy Nick Suss. Not surprised. He's 
very, very smart person. At, at times, he's the smartest person in the room. When it's just he and, he and I in a room, I know he's certainly the smartest person in the room. Um, and he asked a great question near the end of the press conference, essentially saying, Brian, you were there in Cincinnati when there were some leaner teams uh, wearing Bengals jerseys. There wasn't a whole – the cupboard was was on the bare side of things. That's a nice way of putting That's, it. Yeah, I'm trying to be very political about it. And, um, you know, there you were 0-11 at one point. What did you learn from that experience that might help you in another rebuilding-ish situation that you have here in Tennessee? A very good question, a very thoughtful answer. Here's what Bill Callahan had to say. Brian Callahan. Fantastic question. Um, a lot of adversity uh, in those early years. You know, we weren't, we didn't quite have uh, the roster to compete with some of the teams we were playing against. Um, but we saw in those in those dark days uh, the core of what our team was going to be. Um, there was a lot of players there in that in that first and second season that uh, are are still there now and were there for for sort of the the glory of it. But um, you learn. I learned that the, when that, that adversity strikes, consistency. Um, Zach was an incredibly consistent leader. We just kept hammering the message, uh, and we believed in what was happening, even though the wins weren't taking place. Um, there wasn't the tangible evidence that this is what's happening, but we felt it. We saw it in the locker room. We knew at some point, as we kept building our roster, that we were going to be a really good football team. And uh, our players believed it. Our coaches believed it. Um, and that's, those are those are good lessons to to be through some of those lean years. I mean, 0 and 11 was not a fun place to be, um, but we learned a lot from it. And, and really, the foundation of what our team became two years later um, was a lot of guys that had went through that process. And so, you learn a lot about people uh, when things are tough. Um, we learned a lot about our other uh, guys in that football team, and there was a lot of them that were uh, incredibly high character, love playing football, um, and they 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 helped us get out of those those times as well. So, um, yeah, you learn the most when when things aren't going very well. Everyone can be positive when uh when you're winning a bunch of football games so yeah it was those are probably incredible um, intense learning experiences for me and so michael who asked the question at the top of the show about what our thoughts were on how the locker room would adjust by uh, from being coached by variable to being coached by by cali this was the clip i was waiting to get to um and this is I, I think that his his answer is really telling for a couple of reasons number one when a new coach comes in and has to fill the void of a guy like Mike Vrabel, who there were ups and there were downs, there were shortcomings for sure. I'm not trying to gloss over those, but generally his six year tenure with the Titans was a lot about resetting and establishing a strong defined culture of guys who bought into his leadership, bought into his message in that locker room. He was a leader of man, a leader of men type. Brian Callahan coming in, having to fill in, in that role, fill the void left in that locker room. That's a tough ask. And I think it takes a really deliberate and specific approach by him, um, to successfully do that and not get some guys to, you know, struggle to kind of buy in, get some guys to look at him a little skeptically, get some guys to question whether or not um, he, he's somebody that they can put their trust in that can lead this group of men. And the way that he put that, put that question to ease in my mind a little bit, the way that he talked about, man, being 0 and 11 is not a fun place to be. And everybody can be happy. I mean, we heard a lot this week on the radio, folks talking about how things were not always great, even when the Titans were winning. And then here towards the end, when they were doing a lot of losing, some ugly things started to bubble to the surface. Callahan pointing out, man, it's not great to be 0 and 11. Anybody can be happy when you're winning. But it's it's in those times when you're not doing a whole lot of winning, where you find the character of your team. And uh, paraphrasing what he said along the lines of when you've got a when you've got a vision and a plan for your team long term that you and the people around you believe in, even when you're 0 and 11 and the wins aren't there, you still buy in 100 percent to that and trust that that is going to come to fruition and it's going to. You're going to be able to reap those wins eventually because the plan is solid, the process is solid. Then things don't fall apart, and and that's exactly what I think you need in order to fill in the void that was left behind by Mike Vrabel. Yeah, no, echo everything you just said. Okay, all right. Um, let's talk a little bit about the the announcement because that that concludes our review of the the press conference, which was a, a pretty good one. I, 
underwhelming is not a word I'd use, but like it, it, it wasn't a whole lot to it. You know, it was, it was a pretty, it was everything you'd expect. He did a very good job. Um, it wasn't a whole lot said in terms of details. So that was kind of everything we covered. I think that you did, if you, if you didn't hear the actual conference, you just listened to those eight clips. I think you got the whole gist of it. Um, I, I wanted to say some things from earlier in the week when the Brian Callahan news came down. We hadn't had a chance yet to talk about it um, explicitly on the show, but kudos to the Titans for finally doing some really important things with this hiring and with the structuring, the, the, the clear and definite structuring of their upper management. Now, number one, they're letting their GM actually do the GM things. We we've been asking about that since the Rand Carthon press conference that went so poorly. Uh, can you let them do the, like, can you, you got a guy that you, his name tag on his desk says general manager. Can you let him generally manage the team and do the GM things that other GMs do? They're letting him do that now. The, the, the roles for Rand Carthen are very clearly defined, and, and they are he's a very, very powerful person in the Titans organization now, much more powerful than he was before um, this restructure. That's a good thing, I think, just for the general wealth and health, being, health, uh, wealth, health and well-being, there we go, of the football team. I also appreciate them clearly and unambiguously defining the power structure of the upper management, saying, hey, here's what Rand Carthon does. Here's what Chad Brinker does. Here's who they report to. Here's who the people underneath them report to specifically here are their roles this is what you do it's not the hey let's throw the the two their coach and gm hey boys i mean i'm strong let me throw you in the room and y'all just figure it out kind of the approach that they took in the past that clearly did not work all that well for them and then third going into some detail about their vision with this new head coaching hire and the direction of that team good on amy adam strunk for for providing some more detail on that much anticipated vision to the Titans future. And I want, to, I want to read a portion of what she had to say in the press release. She said, quote, this is not my father's NFL. Great line. Great line. You've heard it. You've heard it. You've seen it a lot around because it's very good. It's a very good line. As our league continues to evolve in areas like analytics, sports science and technology, football organizations have become more complex and multifaceted. I want our football operation to be at the forefront of the NFL as teams continue to find new competitive advantages in this new role. Chad Brinker, will blend his executive experience with his strengths in football and scouting to ensure our football operation continues to innovate and grow as new opportunities emerge. Chad's oversight of these areas will allow Rand to focus his full attention and energy on building and leading a championship football team. So if you have not heard, Chad Brinker, formerly Titans assistant GM, now uh, his new role is president of football operations. His role defined, according to the press release, is as football oper excuse me, as president of football operations, a new role for the organization. Brinker will provide executive leadership and support for the entire football side of the operation. His day-to-day -day responsibilities will include direct oversight of the football departments that address salary cap management, something he was already doing, or uh, excuse me, that uh, he was a part of doing, analytics and strategy, something he was already doing, communications and information systems, and team operations, including security, video, equipment, and grounds. Brinker will also continue to provide scouting evaluation of top talent in both college and the NFL. So we now have a very, and some folks were like, well, it's not clearly defined who, because whoa, whoa, they both answered Amy Adams Strunk. That's strange. And it's true. That is strange. Our, our buddy Nick Sess, I believe, is the person that pointed this out on Twitter, how the Titans front office structure as of now is a little bit unique, at least in title. There's no other team in the league that has an executive vice president slash GM, which is what Rand Carthon is and a president of football operations, which is what Chad Brinker is. Um, some teams are close, like Baltimore has an executive vice president and GM and a senior VP of ops, but not president. Green Bay has a GM and executive vice president of ops. Uh, the Chargers had a similar situation. The Giants have a SVP GM and an SVP of ops, but, but nobody that is the GM and VP, executive VP, and then another guy who's a full-blown president of football operations. Now, to be clear, it, there is nothing about this that has alluded to the fact that they are equals or that Chad Brinker is over Rand Carthon. Yes, they both answered Amy Adams Strunk. Part is clear. What I think is the logical uh, reduction here is okay, they gave some roles to Chad Brinker that are not unimportant, but to what you want your GM to be singularly focused on, they are kind of unimportant the grounds, the security. Um, the analytics are important, but that's kind of his wheelhouse, right? That he was already over that department. And then uh, being a part of the salary cap management, kind of crunching the numbers, more of the accounting side of things, which is important for, for Rand Carthon to be a part of. But you want Rand to 
uh, optimally be focused on bringing in the best talent and building the best possible team that he can. And so that's what this structure allows him to do. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think despite it being a unique situation, it's not a bad thing. And I think that in this new era of Titans football, I think it's actually a really good thing that the Titans and Amy Adams Trunk are trying something unique as she clearly posts in that in that um, press release right there. She wants to be, become one of these teams on the front edge of just a competitive advantage and also as a organization as a whole. So I think it's a very unique opportunity for them. And let, let's see how it works out. I, I'm willing to bet that it will work out at least a little better than the last one did. Well, it's a low bar, but yes, I agree. Um, okay, we got some news to get to in the Best Bet Gauntlet before we get out of here. But before we do either of those things, I got to tell you about our wonderful, amazing sponsor here, Boom Boss Craft Pizza and Tap House. Guys, they've got three Middle Tennessee locations in East Nashville, in Murfreesboro, and here in Spring Hill, where JT and I, in, where JT and I are just a short drive down I-65 if you're in the Nashville area, about 20, 25 minutes to get down here. It is awesome. We love Boom Boss. Like we said, genuinely, my, my stomach has been rumbling this entire time. I've been trying to ignore it because I have starved myself today. I am about to go gorge myself on appetizers and pizzas and some of their delicious uh, drink options on tap, a ton of domestic and um, local brews on tap that are all, we've not, I don't think we've yet tasted one we did not like. So uh, a constantly rotating cast of characters, keeping it fresh all the time. They do the food, sports bar, drink option game here at boom Boss, as as well as anybody really it's really a fantastic experience i'm currently in my field of view i see one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen fifteen sixteen flat screen uh tvs right now and i'm sitting in the corner of the place uh, in a separate room I, there's a lot that i can't see like every wall every ceiling in this place has flat screen tvs and it's not the kind you've been to a place where it's like it's a it's sports bar and you, you walk in from outside and you see oh, those TVs everywhere. Great. We're going to have a good view wherever we sit. And you get in there and it's like three channels on, on the T like, that's it. There's just three things going on and, and a bunch of TVs are duplicates. That's not the case here. I mean, I I'm trying to find two TVs. that are duplicate right now. And like I said, I see 15 of them. Genuinely. We're not lying. I don't, do you see a dupe? I see one. I see one duplicate. There's everything in sports that you could possibly want to watch from collegiate women's soccer to um to D2 basketball to off season uh, WWE wrestling WWE was wrestling was on earlier. earlier at the bar off season women's uh L LPGA we've got PTI up there in the corner ESPN obviously is up there like ESPN use right here everything you could want so it's a fantastic dining experience if you love sports like we do we recommend you check out Boomba's Crappy it's in Tap House we love being partnered with Boomba's Okay, JT, we got some news to get to, I understand, today. So without further ado, let's get to the news with producer JT. Yeah, the first one that we allu alluded to earlier today was Vic Fangio actually uh, mutually agreeing with the Miami Dolphins to part ways. He, for the last year, was the defensive coordinator of that team. And um, people were kind of stunned about this one, but the reasons that came out is that he wanted to be closer to family. And Naturally. where was that he's family? Old too. I mean, he he's, is very old, yes. Old. Um, he, that family is in Philadelphia. So where does he actually wind up? Uh, he traveled to Philadelphia earlier today, um, and he's officially signing to be the defensive coordinator of oh, the I Philadelphia missed that entirely. Eagles. Okay. So it, the inevitable became the, reality. Yes. Here. Okay. Um, gotcha. So it's very interesting that one team mutually agreed to let a person leave to be closer. In well, when you're family. Vic Fangio. Yes. When you're a when you're a stallion in the in the in the his, the, lo, the modern history of the NFL, um, when you're an alpha in that way, that you, you deserve to do what you want to do. I can think of another one that's like that, named Bill, hmm. who works for a team in oh, the terrible state of Ohio, um, and that you know I think that that team should take notes on how the Dolphins very gracefully, very respectfully. Um, and very uh, quietly, without without much pushback, handled this this what could be a tricky situation. Hmm, interesting. But just we can leave it at that. Anyways, let's move on to the Titans' first interview request for their uh, defensive coordinator job. They are requesting to interview with Ravens defensive backs coach Denard Wilson for their defensive coordinator job. He also met with the Giants for their DC job. Um, some interesting notes about him: he is the defensive backs coach, which 
Uh, for the Ravens, they currently rank as the number one pass defense this past year. And then when he was with the Philadelphia Eagles just a year ago, they were the number one ranked pass defense in 2022. Some glare, uh, some perfect reviews from a couple of teammates here. Darius Slay recently told uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer that he wished Wilson would have been named defensive coordinator after Jonathan Gannon left for, uh, the Eagles last year, uh, saying, I think he would have made a lot of difference. He was loved by us. I thought for sure he should have stayed. So a very nice review Big for Big shade at the guy who was the DC, by the yes, way. That's, yes. that's tough. That's tough cookies right there. But um, I mean... Is this shocking at all based on the way that we heard Brian Callahan? What did he say in his press conference? That defensively, I like to be like the teams that give me trouble as an offensive coach. In Cincinnati, the Ravens he gave him trouble he, this year. Yes. He played against the Ravens a whole lot the past couple of years, and they have been a very good defense for a long time. And so why not go to that Ravens? Well, it makes total sense. Yep. And especially being on two different teams with two different personnel and being the number one. It worked both defense, times. Right. Exactly. Uh, it's, it's pretty nice and would be a home run higher. Uh, to that coaching staff. And let's talk about the coaching carousel roundup as we've had a couple of coaches over the past uh, 48 hours be hired by teams, starting with the Los Angeles Chargers who get their guy who basically has been set in stone since probably early November or so. Jim Harbaugh <laughs> yeah. uh, is now the coach of the Los Angeles Chargers. He will try to rectify their disastrous situation and get Justin Herbert back into the playoffs um, the Panthers with a little bit of surprise, but I don't think it should be too big of a surprise. They hired Dave Canales, the Buccaneers offensive coordinator earlier today. He was a big part of why Baker Mayfield kind of returned to relevance and will now look to kind of do the same with a second year Bryce Young and kind of tap into that potential. Mm -hmm. And then earlier today, as we were driving here to Boom Boz, the Falcons with a shocking hire, this hire surprising. Raheem Morris, the defensive coordinator of the Los Angeles Rams. He was the defensive coordinator when the Rams won the Super Bowl and also was the interim head coach for the Falcons a couple of years ago when they fired Dan Quinn. So interesting hires there, which only leaves two open spots here, the Seahawks and the Commanders. And there are four candidates that come to mind here, two that it's not very shocking that they haven't taken a job and two that have been talked about a lot. Those two that have been talked about a lot and are finding no who dice. Might, who might that be? Bill Belichick and Mike Vrabel. Very interesting mm -hmm. that they have not uh, been hired anywhere. And then two other guys, Mike McDonald and Ben Johnson, who are still in this playoff race. Interesting to see if these two jobs end up going to them or another guy like Bobby Slowick, who is still in the mix. Well, since the beginning, the commander's job has been tied to Ben Johnson. We, I think everybody still believes that's going to get done eventually. Uh, the yep. Lions, you know, Lions still being in the playoff race. I'd imagine if they were out of the playoff race a long time ago, that this might have been the first hire. Like we, we mm -hmm. don't know. Maybe there's that, maybe that's all smoke and we're just all being fooled. But if we are, it's all of us together. So I think, I think for now that's a, a, a given. Man, what are the Seahawks going to do? I, I I don't know. It's I, pretty crazy you, to me. You if, think about the pendulum swing, yeah. like Mike McDonald, different from the Pete Carroll era, but not super different. It'd be, you know what I mean? Like, I think a lot of those fans are probably in the same boat the Titans fans have been in. Like, let's get, let's take this opportunity. Let's get an offensive guy in here. Let's modernize this thing. And if they get a defensive guy, people are not going to be happy. <laughs> I mean, especially, I think, and if you are the Seahawks and you end up with Dan Quinn, I think it is. I think it's easily. I mean, you could put it probably there with Antonio Pierce, maybe, but it's the maybe the least sexy hire of this coaching oh, it's, cycle. Oh, no, not with not with Antonio Pierce. Really? Easily, you think you think it's the well, worst? because the team at least want like AP had like some momentum. This is true. He had yep. some results. The, the players love him. He like he's a full hero. A little like, what's Dan Quinn got going for him? Nothing. Yeah. Absolutely nothing. Really interesting. Um, but that's going to do it for our news. Today. All right. That's the news. That leaves us with just one more segment to get to today. The best oh, bet boy. gauntlet. Uh, we have we have to, by law, recap what was. You know what? It took us, what, 20, 21, 21 weeks of the year to have a truly disastrous week, which I you know, maybe this is the optimist in me. I count as a win. We have built in a lot of room for error for us in this week. And that's that's just the nature of betting. You're going to have big ups. You're going to have big, big downs. It's always going to come back eventually. Long term, you got to have that winning formula, and we still do. Long term, we are still winning a lot more than we are losing. But last week, we went two and eight. Really tough week. A lot of pros took an absolute bath on that week. Some of the most popular bet, one of the uh, a betting shows that I listened to went 0 and 6 for the first time oh, wow. in the three years that I've, I've been listening to it for three years. They went 0 and 6 for the first time ever. And usually I use them like as a, a guide for where I want to be looking that week. Um, so 
that is reflective of I think just the way that the pros took it. Was a, it was a very week. it was a very square week. I think extremely we, square. We ended it up on the wrong side here, but yeah, we did go two and eight. Easton, you carried the show going two and three this week. Where are those other five losses? You know you're in a tough spot uh, when the two and threes carry in the show. Yeah, it, it, it was an zero and five week. There was uh, one bad beat. I believe my Ravens under uh, yes. lost by a half a point on a last second Justin field Tucker goal. field yep. goal just yep. to put it away, which was tough. He Some, actually told me he did it specifically to oh, spite okay. you. That's yeah. that's very nice. Um, so that happened. Some other bad reads. There were just a couple of ones that I, I was like, yeah, I could see why that didn't happen. Things that felt dead out of the gate. Like, um, oh, that was yep. a, okay. It was it was a tough week, but yes, going 0 and 5 and still 20 picks over 500. <laughs> you're the schizo <laughs> of our of our of our betting uh, of our betting troop here because you're the only person to go 5 and 0. You did it twice this year. Yep. Uh, you also were the only person to go own five. You yeah. did that and then once. and then so to make impressive. it worse, I doubled down all of my money on Buffalo. <laughs> And <laughs> you should have known that it was just not your weekend. It you was not known. my week, but like but you know you said, what? Is there a weekend? This upcoming weekend. It's, we were on to a new week. That does not matter anymore. So uh, with my first pick of the week 23 now, I believe it's of oh, the weeks? championship weekend. Best bet championship gauntlet. Yep, I think it is weekend, 20. Uh, best bet gauntlet. Now, uh, full, full transparency for no, you. If you are losing faith in us for having a bad week, I would caution you not to because we are coming back with you to have a week where I think we both feel very, very confident in all our picks. This is a week where, just like, uh, just like the t the Titans collaboration, I think to get the people a a big week here. It, we, it we, is. We, and, we had some trade and, picking and be, or some pick clear, trading. We did have some pick trading. <laughs> to be to be clear, we have been betting on this show formally and officially for forty, but somewhere between forty five and fifty total weeks now, right? Between last year and this year, I went back and checked this week. We have only once in the history of the show had back-to-back -back weeks where we were under 500. Uh, that's, so it's, it's a little interesting. The trend you know, would indicate that this that, week we have a bounce back. We're going to have a bounce back. But we with hope. the first pick, this is a line that I sniped earlier today, and it's one that um, is going to continue, I think, to bounce back and forth. So you really just have to watch it. It I'm will taking, be there again. I'm, t I'm taking Detroit plus seven and a half. So I'm getting the hook here at San Francisco. Um, this one, I think, is pretty easy to me. This is a, it, It's a battle of um the Brock Purdy train maybe losing a little bit of steam a team also in the San Francisco potential 49ers. NFL MVP Brock Purdy <laughs> he's losing a little bit of steam okay. um I think he is the five out of five uh candidate for that MVP <laughs> award there but um last week was not a very good week for him and I think they're playing a team once again in the Detroit Lions who uh just have the momentum right now and if you want to look to it as San Francisco is a team that notoriously beats down on on teams at home well the San Francisco 49ers are 0-6 against the spread in their last six at home. This is a team that has lost some momentum, and currently they have a lot of questions right now. Will Debo Samuel play? Which, if he doesn't, even helps this bet even more, I think. Um, and so I think with all this, it's to say that there's no way that this Detroit team, with how good their run defense is, how good their red zone defense is, there's no way I think that Detroit loses by more than a touchdown. I think it's going to be a very close game that might come down to a field goal. So I'm going to take the underdog and uh, maybe bet a little bit with my heart as well to see the Motor City Kitties finally get to a Super Bowl. I'm with you on that. I'm going to take the other uh, game and take the side on this one for my first pick of the conference championship best bet gauntlet. Taking Baltimore minus three against Kansas City. Locked this line in earlier in the week, so hopefully you are following our bets on uh, at Hot Read Pod on Twitter where we lock in early lines because this number is now to four, four and a half at some places, and I don't think it's coming back down, frankly. This three is crazy. It's crazy that it was at a three. I think that the Ravens are going to win by at least a touchdown, maybe 10 points, 10 plus points, but not shocking in this game. I'm going to, I'm probably going to have some escalating alts, some, some ladder alts on, on the, uh, the, the spread here. Baltimore is dramatically better than either of the teams that the chiefs have, I think fooled some folks with their last two games in the playoffs. Now, some of their playoff success is real. I'm not saying it's totally phony. I think they've been better the last two weeks than they've been largely most of the year. But the Ravens are the only team in the league, I think, in history who have a plus 100 point differential against playoff teams in a season. They didn't have a single home game this year against a team that was below 500, and they went eight and one, seven and one in those games. Um, I think they lost just one game. In, I think in it was fluky, to the Colts. Yeah, it was in fluky fashion to the Colts. And so this is just a such this is just such a better team 
than the the hospital bills or the hospital and freezing dolphins that they played the past two weeks. I don't think the Chiefs are going to be able to score much in this game. And that's going to be kind of a common theme of our bets here, but that's really as simple of a handicap as I can give you. I think that Baltimore is going to be able to score, and I think Kansas City is largely not going to. I think this Mike McDonald defense for the Ravens is going to put an end to the uh, the resurgence of what was a pretty dead Kansas City team in the regular season. I think this is where the train ends for them. Give me Baltimore minus three against Kansas City, and then they win by a lot more than that. I'm right there with you. I'm all Baltimore. And Kenneth says, who is brave enough to say the Swifties and Mahomes are going home sad? I don't even have to be brave enough. I will say me with my chest. They're going home They're sad. going home sad. I'm so tired of this narrative. <laughs> I need to stop seeing Travis Kelsey on every other ad right now. Um, I, I'm all in on the Ravens this week. And I'm uh, right there with you with my second pick here, staying with this Speaking game of right there with me. Uh, I'm taking Baltimore minus two and a half in the first half spread against Kansas City. A lot of what you said when at home, their point differential in the first half against other teams is pretty crazy. I think they average 12 point. I think it was point three, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, some decimal, but that's how much of a margin they lead at halftime in a lot of games at home. Obviously, last week was a very fluky week for them, despite playing good defense why they didn't cover that first half spread they let a punt return come back and, and, and they'd also had as despite having over two weeks off three weeks off for most of their star still players, only let cj stroud and that offense score three points in the in the yep. first half i think that's going to happen once again here this uh this ravens defense is legit man they're going to get mar uh marlon humphreys back mm -hmm. this week i'm super excited to see what this defense can do um, especially since they play a lot of man and they play really good man. And I think that's something that uh, teams who have been playing the Kansas City Chiefs have been struggling with. I think they're going to be able to limit Rasheed Rice and Travis Kelsey and what they do. That linebacking core is legit. And I think even if Baltimore starts to play with their food at the end of that game and um, you, that gets closer down to that three-point line there, I think in the first half, it's a pretty sure bet that this Ravens team uh, in the first AFC championship game, I think ever at M&T bank stadium. I'm not sure. I okay. think it's been, it's the first one in a long time though. I sure. think the, the crowd is going to come out roaring, which I think oh, it's Patrick, be Patrick, it's yeah, be Patrick, Patrick Mahomes did really not have to deal with that last week because as I heard from people who were there at the team, it, Apparently it, the whole crowd was just scared. The, 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 whole time. the, the crowd was scared <laughs> because they knew what was happening. Um, but this tense, team, I mean, Baltimore is, a, yeah, Baltimore is a different animal. Um, so I, I'm going to go with the Baltimore first half spread of minus two and a half. Yep, I love it. With my second pick of the conference championship best bet gauntlet, I'm going with what should be the shortest and simplest handicap I've ever given on the best bet gauntlet when I've handed out a pick. I'm thinking Kansas City, Baltimore under 44 and a half. I think it's going to get to 45, maybe 45 and a half by the end of the weekend. So maybe wait to bet it. People are betting this number up because folks are buying into the Chiefs offense being back, the resurgence in the playoffs, them hitting overs in their first. I think they hit overs, but they definitely hit over last week. I think overs in their first two games. Um, again, I think that the Chiefs are not going to be able to score. And I think the, the the Ravens will, but it, you know, the unlike last week against the Houston defense where the dam kind of butt burst towards the end and they were just starting to put, put up points um, that spags defense with the chiefs is not going to be that way. And so while I think Baltimore will be able to score, I don't think it's going to be just racking up 30, 35, 40 points. Uh, and for that reason, I think that you're taking Kansas city, Baltimore under 44 and a half. I feel very confident about that pick. Yeah, you know, actually, I'm going to go out of order here. Let's just finish off this bludgeoning of this Chiefs team. Okay. And I'm going to take my final pick here. Uh, with my final pick now, my third pick here. I'm taking Baltimore over the team total of 23 and a half, which sure. seems pretty low to me, considering mm -hmm. how this Lamar Jackson led team may be able to slice and dice uh, three touchdowns this, this in the Kansas field City Chiefs team. That's three touchdowns and a field goal. Um, and with Justin Tucker, it's never out of the question that he may be able to get another one in there um, <laughs> as well. This is a Kansas City team that has been very bad against the run. We saw what Josh Allen was able to do against them last week. Now you're going up against a triple-headed threat of Gus Edwards, who's ground and pound like James Cook was, uh, the explosive guy in Justice Hill who I think may be able to find a gap, and then Lamar Jackson, who can never count out to get a bunch of yards here. Uh, I think this is a really well-put-together team right now. Um, and I think that this is a, a team where Baltimore is going to be easily able to get over 23 and a half points. So I'm going to take their team total. All right. With my third pick of the conference championship, best bet gauntlet, my first of three props, I'm taking Travis Kelsey under 62 and a half receiving yards. This is also to just spite the, the Swifties and the Kansas city chiefs. Um, but I charted this out by hand, like an old man. Uh, I went through oh, the wow. entire season's worth of tight end performances against the Ravens. And I, I you know, they've, they've got a pretty good safety back there. 
um, that I think is going to be playing entirely on Travis Kelsey all day, shutting them down. Um, and I, I, I looked at a couple of, not a couple, all of the guys this year that were the lead tight ends against the Ravens defense. Only two of them gone over this number. Frank McBride in his coming out party game where he had 10 catches for 95 yards. It took 10 catches to get there. And then George Kittle, um, when he had one of the one or two times a year when George Kittle just goes thermonuclear, uh, had seven catches, 126 yards against them in week 16. Every other week, everybody was under that number pretty uh, pretty comfortably. The average on the year for, for uh, tight ends against the Ravens is four receptions for 41 yards. I went and looked the Bills and the Dolphins, the other two defenses that the Chiefs have played this year. For comparison, the Bills this year have allowed 5.1 receptions and 49 yards, and the Dolphins have allowed 5.5 receptions and 55 yards, um, whereas the Ravens are 4 and 41. So a significantly more stout defense against tight end receiving threats. For that reason, I think the Travis Kelsey uh, resurgence the past two weeks is going to be proven to be a little bit more fake than not. And I think that he'll have a nice night. I, he told me he had 45, 50 yards, three or four or five receptions. I'm with you. I just, I don't think the difference here will be, he's not going to get that big catch and run where this, you know, he, he catches the ball 12 yards downfield and there's 23 yards of yak. I don't think that's coming against this Ravens defense and against the secondary. So give me Travis Kelsey under 62 and a half receiving yards. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. My uh, fourth pick here uh, on this week's best bet gauntlet just going out of order just to keep it, you know. I was about to say, up. now you're making it hard. Yeah, yeah, it's it's all right. I'm going to take Christian McCaffrey over four and a half receptions this week against the Detroit Lions. This is a Detroit Lions team that has been really able to put pressure on teams lately. Aiden Hutchinson and company have been really getting after uh, the quarterbacks. And I think that's going to happen once again this week against Brock Purdy. And when, when Brock Purdy gets under pressure here, who does he look to to dump off to? Christian McCaffrey, and I think sure. that's going to happen a lot. Uh, Christian McCaffrey has had uh, four receptions or more in his last four games. He's gone over four and a half in three of those four. This seems pretty safe to me, how mm -hmm. much pressure they're going to get on him, just and also how much they're going to try to design Christian McCaffrey to get around that linebacking core that is a little banged up for this Detroit team. Yep. I think this is pretty easy for me, so I'm going to take the over on Christian McCaffrey receptions at four and a half. With my fourth pick, pick of this weekend's best bet goblin. I'm taking Lamar Jackson over 10 and a half rush attempts. And I'm now going to vamp because I remember I have notes on it that I have on my phone and I foolishly didn't pull them up. Here they are. Okay. Just some notes on Lamar Jackson as a rusher. There's a big game element to this in three of his last four. Um, all, actually all four of his postseason performances, Lamar Jackson has gone over this number of rush attempts. So when it's not cut in time, he takes off with the ball. We saw an uptick in designed rushes and keepers from him last week. He had seven. Apparently, the average for him per game this year was 4.4. So they are using him in that way more. It's Again, it's 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 go time, and they're going to let their best athlete on the field be the best athlete out there. The Chiefs, for their part, pressure the quarterback at the second highest rate uh, of all teams this year. It leads to more scrambles because you're getting the guy off the spot. And when Lamar Jackson sees nothing downfield and he's out of the pocket, he's going to take off and run. The Chiefs have also allowed more rush attempts versus mobile quarterbacks in recent uh, playoff history. He's allowed; they've allowed Allen to run for ten or more, run ten or more times in the playoffs twice. Hurts twelve times. Um, Wilson eight and four. Fields eleven times. And their primary quarterback spy for the Chiefs, Willie Gay, is banged up. So you're going to have a, a pretty cold and windy day out there in Baltimore. Some winter conditions. I think that the, the Ravens are going to be able to ball control. I think they're going to be in the lead. I think that that uh, for the most part, Lamar Jackson is going to take off and scurry when he needs to. And I think 11 rush attempts in this game is going to come pretty easily. Yeah, with my final pick here, I'm going to take another rusher on the Ravens here. Gus Edwards, over 43 and a half rushing yards this week. Like you just said, this is a rushing team that ranks 27th in DVOA against the rush. And uh, that's something that this Ravens team is going to really want to exploit. Uh, you might look at last week's game as you kind of showed me today is like it doesn't tell the tale, even though Justice Hill out snapped him two to one. He, uh, it came out that he was a little banged up in that game and they wanted to rest him as kind of a look ahead to, we really need by the time he was clear to come back. The game was out. Of the game. Yes. There was and, no point to bring it back. Um, and 
this Ravens team is probably going to really need to lean on Gus Bus doing what he does well, right. uh, ripping off a couple of runs, breaking some tackles. And I think that happens. And I think 43 and a half is a pretty low number here for someone who really only needs one big run to really get uh, almost half of those yards. So yep. with that, I'm going to take the over on Gus Edwards, 43 and a half. All right. With my final pick of the conference championship best bet gauntlet weekend, I'm taking a kicker prop, JT. Ooh. Give me Jake Moody over one and a half field goals made. This is a reflection of what I think is a really nice research of during the season. They, there wasn't a whole lot to write home about in terms of the Detroit's red zone defense, but in the playoffs, both of these games that they've won, their red zone defense has come up really clutch. And I think that's going to continue in this game, especially because it's kind of a Titan secondary um, situation for them because they are, they are a team defensively personnel wise and secondary. They just can't match up with with the guys the 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 49ers have on offense and so i think their approach is going to be very much that titans bend don't break we're going to let them move between the 20s get really stout inside the 20s our our red zone defense is going to really wall up when they get near the end zone we're going to force threes and not sevens that's what i think is going to happen in this game and i think it's going to lead to at least two jake moody field goals which i think that he's going to make and for that reason give me jake moody over one and a half field goals made and that concludes our conference championship slate for the best bet gauntlet in review jt has detroit plus seven and a half at san francisco baltimore minus two and a half in the first half versus kansas city baltimore over 23 and a half uh team points team total points gus edwards over 43 and a half rushing yards and christian mccaffrey over four and a half receptions for my part i have got kansas city baltimore under 44 and a half baltimore minus three versus kansas city Travis Kelsey under 62 and a half receiving yards, Lamar Jackson over 10 and a half rush attempts and Jake Moody over one and a half field goals made. That is our best bet gauntlet for the championship weekend. And that is our show. Appreciate everybody that tuned in with us live today. Do us a couple of favors. If you're not subscribed to the YouTube, please hit subscribe. It's very, very helpful to us and it's free to you. So help us out. Hit subscribe, tell a friend about the show, send the show to a friend via text, whatever you can do to help us spread the word about the show. We would really appreciate it. Make sure you're following us on social media at Hot Read Pod on TikTok, Twitter, and Instagram. And um, one last thing that I've wanted to Come mention. Come to Boombaz. And the, yeah, I guess there was something else I wanted to mention, but oh, I forgot. I mean, the last time, the next time we'll talk to everybody. Yes, thank you. Next show uh, is going to be next week sometime. I believe we're, I think we're officially now. Oh, wait, next week we're going to the Senior Bowl. Yes. Huh, that was what I was trying. Yes. Thank you. Here we go. I wanted to tell you about what we're doing next week. We're going to the Senior Bowl. Uh, we're going to be there. Uh, Zach and Sonia are going to be there. That was their thing last year. We decided to to hop on the Senior Bowl train. We're going to go to the Senior Bowl and the Combine this year, which is super exciting. While we're down there, we'll have uh, a bunch of content coming out. Don't quite know what the schedule is going to be. We're going to do shows most evenings, I believe, like we did at the Combine last year. Don't know exactly when those are going to be. As soon as we do know, we will let you know. So make sure you're following us on social media so you can see, especially on Twitter, you can see those updates about what our schedule is going to be. We'll be uh, shifting gears a little bit, talking prospects, introducing uh, ourselves and you all to a lot of these guys that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of months in this year's draft. I know that the Senior Bowl uh, roster is as stacked as it's been in a long time. So really stoked to get down there and see some of these cats play see some of these cats cook it's gonna be a good time until then until tuesday which will be our first show it's the first day we're gonna be down there we will talk to you on tuesday for producer jt i'm your host easton freeze this has been the hot read podcast and we'll talk to you next week <laughs>